In this video, we'll tackle how we can install a basic set of development tools on a Linux, specifically a CentOS workstation. As a reminder, here are the set of tools that we'll be looking at. Now we're covering the basic set of categories of types of development tools, such as source control, terminals, IDEs, etc. Now this list is a great place to get started, but it is not intended to be the list that you should always use, or even necessarily the tools that you have to use. If you've been developing for a while and you have a separate tool that you use in a category, such as as a text editor or IDE, feel free to use that instead. This is simply a suggested set of tools that you can get started with if you're not sure how to get going. With that, we're going to dive into the hands-on portion of this lab. We're going to look at how we can install each one of these tools and make sure that they're working correctly on our CentOS workstation. So with that, let's dive right into the hands-on exercises. All right, here we are. I've logged into my CentOS workstation, and it's a basic installation at this point. I've opened up Firefox and launched our learning lab system and found our developer workstation and environment setup module. If we look down here at the bottom of this module, we will find our setting up your Linux CentOS workstation as a development environment lab. Let's start the lab. Now in our first piece here, it just gives us the basic information. So our objectives are to install a basic development tool set and verify each of these tools are working. Now there is a note here on administrative rights. As with any case where you're trying to install new software onto a platform, you do need to have access to the rights to install software. In this case, this means administrative rights and sudo access inside of a Linux world. If you're working off of a managed laptop where you do not have access as a sudo user, be sure that you get a sudo account before you continue. All right, moving right along to our CentOS specific preparation. Now we'll be setting up our development environment. And while you don't necessarily need a GUI environment to do development, most users, if you're going to be doing a lot of development, do want to have some sort of a graphical interface. And so if you did your original CentOS installation on a workstation without a graphical interface, you can quickly set up a basic GNOME desktop using these commands. Now I've already run these by nature of the fact that we're logged in and looking at a graphical desktop, but we can talk through them. This first command uses sudo yum group install to go ahead and install the X Windows system, which gives us the ability to do a graphical interface. This next chunk installs the basic GNOME desktop, which is the typical desktop used on Linux platforms, whether it's CentOS, Ubuntu, or other platforms out there today. After that, we install a basic font set so that inside of our graphical interface, we've got kind of the typical fonts library available. And then finally, we, we configure our system to go ahead and start the default graphical interface at startup so that we have that interface when we reboot our workstation. Now, I've done those steps already. Now we're into this place where we've got our GUI desktop. Our first step we want to do is install some basic Linux tools and utilities. If you've done a minimal installation, you won't have these. But if you've done a basic or a different type of installation, you may already have them. It doesn't hurt to try to reinstall just to verify. So we'll use sudo yum install and we'll set up curl, openssl, and wgit. Now using yum, these will download and install for us. And these give us those utilities that we want so that we can download uh, resources from the internet, such as packages to install different pieces of software. All right, we're all set there. And then our last step on this page is to install the basic development tools on our CentOS workstation. Now, what uh, the big pieces that are installed here are all the pieces necessary to install software from source. For example, the GCC C compiler. As we install other applications and systems through the rest of this lab, we'll need those abilities. Rather than pick and choose individual ones, we'll just install the common development tools group from yum. Because as we go through, there will be lots of different pieces out of this package we need. And as we're setting up a development workstation, having those common development tools will be helpful. Excellent, all of those that group of development tools are now installed. And we can move along to our next step, source control systems. Now there are several different source control systems out there, but the one we'll be using, and probably the most common one you'll run across in other communities, is the git source control tool. Now it was already installed when we did that development tools group. Let's just verify that it's working with git dash dash version. And we can see that we do indeed have git version 1831 installed. Let's go ahead and attempt to use Git to clone down a sample repository from GitHub. So here we're cloning on the Hello Network repository from GitHub. And we can see that we were able to clone that down successfully. 
We'll move along to terminals and shells. In terminals and shells, we'll be looking at making sure that our bash terminal is working correctly. Now bash is the default terminal in many Linux platforms, including CentOS. So we've already opened up our terminal here. Let's go ahead and just make sure that we can run bash scripts successfully to verify our bash terminal is working. We'll change into the hello network directory that we just cloned down from GitHub. If we look in this directory, we'll see that we have a hello network.sh bash script. Let's run this just to verify that bash is working dot slash hello network dot sh and indeed we do see the hello network so it looks like bash is in good shape and functioning for us. We'll move right along into programming languages. Now we'll be installing both Python as well as Node in this programming languages step and on the Python side we'll install Python 2714 as well as Python 365 as we go through. In order to do this, we'll be installing and compiling from source, which is a common way of installing software on a Linux workstation. We'll start out by changing into the user source directory, where we'll actually copy down and clone, or copy down all of our files. And now we're going to use the wget utility to copy down the tar file, the compiled and compressed, or the compressed source code files from Python. And then we'll use the tar command to extract those. So I'm going to copy grab these two commands from the learning lab and we'll run them inside of our terminal. We've run those and now if I do an ls we'll see that we have our Python 2714 directory. We'll change into this directory. Now that we're in the directory, we'll run the common commands configure and then make alt install to go ahead and get these set up so that we can install it correctly. I'll copy these commands and we'll paste them into our terminal. Now the make alt install will go ahead and install Python 2714 as a parallel installation to the default version of Python that is installed with CentOS 7. This is suggested so that we don't make any changes to the underlying Python system pieces should CentOS rely on a specific version of Python to go through. Now, one of the advantages of Python is this ability to install different versions of them and take advantage of it on a single system. All right, the alternate installation of Python 2714 has completed. It does take a while to do an installation from source. Let's see actually what happened as it went through. Now our alt installation install Python 2714 as I mentioned, in parallel. So we can look and see where it's installed here. ls-l user local bin, and then we'll do, we'll say Python star. And so we're gonna look at all of the files that are in there. So this user local bin directory is where we see Python 2.7 uh, installed here. And if I check, we can grab this path, this explicit path to the, this version, executable version of Python. And if we do a dash, oops, dash capital V next to that, we'll see that that is indeed Python 2.7.14. If I do a Python dash V using the default version of Python that came with CentOS 7, we can see that that's 2.7.5. And if we also check Python 2.7, the alias Python 2.7, that's also Python 2.7.5. Now we don't want to necessarily have to type the full path to Python 2.7.14 every time we want to use that. So we'll create a symbolic link for Python 2.7.14 to point to this installed version. And that's in fact what step five does in our lab here. So if we copy that, we will then paste it into our terminal and it creates a symbolic link using the ln-s command. Now if I do Python 2.7.14 capital V, we can see that we are on Python 2.7.14. This gives us an easy way to make sure that we're running the specific version of Python 2.7 we're after. Now our next step is to download and install PIP, the Python package installation tool that we'll use anytime we want to install a pack package into our Python 2.7 installation. To do that, we'll first change back into our user source directory, and then we'll use wget one more time to download the git pip file from Python. We'll run these. Now if I check, I now have this git pip.py. Now we want to run this using the Python 2714 version so that we install this into that application or that version of Python. And we'll do that with this command here in step seven.
That completes our installation of Python 2.7.14. We'll repeat the steps for Python 3.6.5. So once again, we're going to start by changing into the user source directory to put us where we want. We actually happen to already be there, but we'll run the command just to be sure. We'll then download the source code for Python 3.6.5 from Python with wget and use tar to extract it. Now if we check our directory listing, we can now see we have a new directory for Python 3.6.5 that we've extracted. We'll change into that directory. Okay, and that's what step three was. I just typed it. And now we'll use once again this, the dot configure and the dot make alt install to go ahead and do an alternate installation of Python 3.6.5 on our CentOS workstation. Just like with Python 2.7.14, this step will take a few minutes to complete. So let's go ahead and get it started. All right, our installation of Python 3.6 is completed. We can now use Python 3.6-V to access our Python 3.6 installation that's there. If we wanted Python 3 to work, we could do a symbolic link similar to what we did at the end of the Python 2 installation to go through. Now we don't need to manually install pip, part of the installation process actually installed it for us uh, during the piece there, so we're in good shape. Now moving right along, we'll continue our installation and verification of Python 3, or 2 and 3 by checking to make sure that both Python 2 and 3 are working. So we'll run through these steps here. We'll start by changing back into our home directory with cd tilde, and then we'll verify that Python 3.6 is installed correctly with this command which is actually the same one that we just ran, but we'll check it once more. We can now verify that Python, Python 2.7.14 is working. Once again, we did this once already, but we'll just double check once more that we're in good shape. And now if we do verify, as just as a reminder, the default version of Python still is Python 2.7.5, which is the default on uh, CentOS 7 when we install it. Now our final Python step is to make sure that our virtual environments are working as expected. Now, virtual environments are methods of creating these isolated environments with specific versions of Python along with any independent sets of libraries that you may need. And we can create Python virtual environments for both 3.6 as well as with 2.7. So we'll test and make sure that both of these are working. We'll do this first with Python 3.6 using the new suggested method of creating and managing virtual environments with Python 3.6, which is the built-in VE and V module. And so Python 3.6-m VENV for the VENV module, and then we'll create a virtual environment called py3-venv. We've created it, and we can activate it with source py3venv bin activate. And now inside of our virtual environment, if we type python-v, now our, we're working within Python 3.6.5, which makes it easier and shows that we are indeed working inside of that virtual environment. We will deactivate this virtual environment and now move down and we'll create one for Python um, 2.7 as well. Now the VE and V module is added is part of Python 3.6 by default. Python 2.7 does not have one by default. We have to install the virtual environment module using pip. And so we'll do that with this command. And so we're explicitly calling that Python 2.7.14 that we want to use, dash m pip for the pip module, and then install virtual environment to install virtual environment inside of that piece. Now we need sudo in this case because we're installing it at the global level on our workstation. Typically we don't use sudo with pip. Once that's in place, now we can use a command similar to what we did with Python 3.6, but this time we'll be using the module virtual env that we just installed. So Python 2.7.14, in this case we're using the alias, the symbolic link we set up, dash m virtual env py2 venv. This will create a new virtual environment. and we can activate it just like we did. In this case, our virtual environment is py2venv bin activate. Now with Python dash capital V, we can see that our virtual environment is Python 2714 as was intended. We'll deactivate to go ahead and close that down. At 
This completes the installation and verification of Python, and we'll move right on to Node. To install Node, we'll use yum, but we first need to get yum prepped to be able to install and connect to the Node resources. We can set up that RPM location with this curl command here. This will download a quick script and then you execute it with bash to add that RPM repository. All right, with that done, now we can go ahead and actually use yum to install node. We can verify that node was installed with node-v shows us that we've got version 11.1. We've got our programming languages set up. Let's go ahead and set up our text editors and IDE. The IDE we'll be using will be Atom. We'll be installing this by downloading the RPM directly from GitHub's Atom repository and then using yum to do a local install based on that RPM we download. We'll start out by changing into the ops directory, which is a common place to download uh, optional software. And then we'll use sudo wget to go ahead and download the RPM file. Now that it's downloaded, we can go ahead and use yum local install to install that RPM onto our workstation. Once it's installed, we can go ahead and start Atom by simply typing Atom. And we'll open up our Atom editor here. And we can use this for doing different types of code editing and elements like that. We'll close it for now. With this done, we'll move on to our development tools and clients installations. We have several that we'll install. We're going to start out with Postman. We're going to do a similar process as we did with Atom. We'll start out by changing into our op directory or just verifying that we are still in opt. And then we'll download the latest version of Python with sudo wget. Okay, with that done, we will go ahead and use tar to extract out Postman. Now this extracts our Postman application to the directory, but what we want to do is create a symbolic link to make it easy to run that. We'll do that with sudo ln-s. Now we've got a link for Postman so that we can use it quite quickly and easily by typing Postman. Now, when we run Postman from the CLI like this, it actually opens up as a CLI app, which is, or a terminal app, which isn't usually what we want. We want to be able to launch this as like an application launcher from the menu. So we'll close out, and we're actually in this step five, create an application launcher for Postman so it shows up in our menu. So let's create a application launcher for Postman so we can launch it from the menu. We'll leave the op directory so that we can move to our home directory represented by tilde, so cd tilde, where we can create a template for our application launcher. Now that we're in our home directory, we'll run this echo command that's in step five. And this creates a file called postman.desktop. Now it's currently in our home directory and it's owned by us. To turn this into an application launcher, we have to change the ownership as well as place it in the correct location. Step six, we'll go ahead and take care of both of these for us. Now with that done, we should be able to find it in our menu. Here under programming, we can see Postman.
Once Postman starts up, we can click this button at the bottom just to go directly into the app if we don't want to set up our own Postman account. And close some of these pop-ups that come through, and we can test and verify that Postman is indeed working and enabling us to send REST APIs by making a REST API for just a quick joke. We'll copy in this URL, and we'll put it inside of our place, and then we'll set up a header for accept application JSON, and we'll send this request off. Let me get our joke back. Why do wizards clean their teeth three times a day? To prevent bat breath. All right, we now see that Postman is working, so let's go ahead and close it and move on to our next utility, ngrok. We will once again change back into our op directory where we will download the ngrok application. We'll download the ngrok zip file from their site. Then we will unzip that file we just downloaded. And finally, we will move the ngrok executable to the user local bin directory, which is a common location for executable files. And with that done, we can simply type ngrok HTTP 5000 to bring up a temporary uh, test tunnel. We can see that our tunnel is indeed online and giving us the addresses that we could test to. We don't currently have an application running, so we'll just press Control C to quit out of ngrok. Our next application utility that we'll set up is Google Chrome. Now Google Chrome is just another web browser, but one of the reasons you want, may want to use it as a development environment is for the great developer tools that are available for exploring the REST APIs that you may be using. And so inside of Terminal, the first step is to create a new yum repo file so that we can install Google Chrome from the Google repo. We use, we're going to start out by changing right back into our home directory before running these commands. So back cd tilde, and now we will go ahead and run this echo command. We do ls-l, we see that we've got Google Chrome.repo. Now we need to set the file and move it to the correct directory as a repo file. We'll do that with our commands here. This now moves it into the Etsy yum repos directory along with the rest of the repositories. Now we do want to make sure that we've got the public key so that we can show that we're actually getting the appropriate software from resources we trust. So we'll download the public signing key and then go ahead and add that into our system as a trusted key. With that done, now we can go ahead and install Google Chrome using yum. Once the installation is complete, we should be able to find Google Chrome from our application launcher menu. We'll open up Google Chrome. Now Google Chrome wants to set up a default key ring to store for, your secure, uh, for any password you save. Go ahead and cancel that out for now, but you could set your own up. Now if you want to make Google Chrome the default browser as opposed to Firefox, you can go ahead and keep that checked and then decide for yourself whether you want to send crash reports and statistics to Google. I will go ahead and uncheck default browser, but keep those sending correctly. And once we've opened up Google Chrome, here underneath the three dots and under more tools is where we will find the developer tools that we can open up and access. And here we can see our developer tools have opened up, and this gives us the ability to explore different pieces. Different learning labs will show you how to use these, but for now we can see that they are working, and we'll go ahead and close Chrome. Our next tool we're going to install is OpenConnect. OpenConnect is an open source VPN client that you can use as an alternative to Cisco AnyConnect if you don't have access to it. The first step we want to do is go ahead and activate the Apple release repositories for YUM. These are extra software that is not necessarily active by default. And then with that done, we can now use YUM to install Network Manager OpenConnect, which will give us the ability to connect with the OpenConnect library. 
And with it installed, now we could, we could go ahead and do a connection if we had a VPN to connect into. We can do this easily from the terminal with openconnect-b and then the VPN address you would send to. As an example would be sudo openconnect-b and then to connect to dcloud, we'd have dcloud-rtp-anyconnect.cisco.com and it would prompt you for the username and password that you want to connect with. That would then establish your VPN connection so you're ready to go. Once it's, you have an active connection, you can go ahead and di disconnect that by using checking for the open connection process ID using sudo ps-ax, grep open connect will then show you where your connection was made in the background and the, the process ID, in this case 22741, and then you could use sudo kill 22471 to disconnect your VPN. And once again, if you have any connect, you can certainly use that as an alternative to the open source open connect application. Moving on to our last piece will be our application container engine or Docker. We will start out by downloading the Docker repo so that we can install this and use yum to install Docker. Our wgit command here will go ahead and download the repo file from Docker. Similar to what we've seen in the past, we'll use change own and then move to put this repo file in the proper location on our workstation. And our public key so that we can make sure that we're getting appropriate software that we trust from Docker. And then finally, we'll use sudo yum install to install docker ce for the community edition. Oop. Didn't copy the s correctly, so we'll do sudo yum install. Okay, with it installed, now we can go ahead and just make sure that it started using the system CTL to manage the docker services. Now this installs the Docker runtime engine so we can, we can run Docker containers, build Docker images, things like that. Docker Compose is a, a, a second piece of software that lets you actually build up and manage entire applications with multiple different types of images. It's a common tool used, however it's not installed by default when you install Docker Community Edition on Linux. We can use this block of commands here to download Docker Compose and then set the permissions properly and put it in the user local bin directory. Let's go ahead and run these so that we can have Docker Compose as well. So Docker Compose is now in place. Now, if we want, we want to be able to run Docker as our own user without having to write type sudo for every single Docker command. To do that, we'll create a Docker group and then add our user to it. So this shows that the group docker was already existed, probably from one of the previous installation commands, but this makes sure that it's there. And now we'll use user mod to add our current account, in this case I'm logged in as the vagrant user, to that docker group. Excellent. Now we do have to log out and log back in to verify that the group membership is reevaluated. Okay, I've gone ahead and restarted and logged back into my workstation here. Now we can verify that Docker is working as expected. So we'll start by just running a BusyBox container to verify that we can run Docker correctly. Here we can see it's pulling down the image from the web. Now it started the, the Docker container and then stopped because we didn't give it anything to do. But we can verify that it did run by doing Docker PS-A and we can see that right here we do have our BusyBox image container that had run and exited. So we can see the Docker is indeed working correctly. This brings us to the end of this learning lab and we've gone ahead and installed all of the pieces that we were aiming for. Great job.